A History of Southern Missouri and Northern Arkansas by William Monks, published in 1907. Colonel Monks Enforces the Civil Law. Number 46. In the month of July 1865, the author was ordered to declare the civil law in force in the counties of Texas, Dent, Shannon, Oregon, Howell, Ozark, and Douglas, and report to his regiment again at Springfield for the purpose of being discharged. The long looked for and final result of the war had come with victory couched upon every man who had borne his flag to the breeze of his country, and to those who had lain themselves on the altar of their country and died that it might live. There was general rejoicing among the loyal people that there was not a foot of territory in American soil but where the stars and stripes once more floated unmolested either by foreign or domestic enemies. And while the Confederates had fought manfully for what they conceived to be right and had laid many of their sons on the altar and sacrificed them to a cause that they believed to be right, Yet a large majority of them rejoiced when they learned that the cruel war was over. Although their cause was forever lost, yet the country that they had loved so well and the flag still floated and invited them back as errant sons. The 16th Regiment, with a large number of other regiments, was discharged at Springfield. Then a scene ensued that Americans had never witnessed before. The blue and the gray began to meet and greet each other as friends and seemed to forget that just a few months previous they had been meeting each other armed for the purpose of slaying one another. A general amnesty proclamation had been granted by General Grant to all the rebels who had surrendered. Their officers and commanders should discharge them, and they should be allowed to retain their sidearms for their own protection and return home for the purpose of again building up and establishing their homes. Again, meet their wives, their children, fathers and mothers, neighbors and friends, and once more be united in all the ties of love. To again reinstate churches, and instead of studying and practicing the art of war, they should beat their swords into pruning hooks and aid in establishing and building up society and good government. But lo, one of the most sad and heart-rending scenes confronted many Confederates and Federals on returning to the places where they had once had happy homes and sweet families. They were not found. During the terrible war, Many of the loved ones that they had left behind had been called from time to eternity. The home had disappeared, and nothing was left but the soil, all of the improvements being entirely destroyed. But they, with the courage of heroes, gathered the fragments of their families, went to work improving and building houses, refencing their farms, re-erecting church houses and school houses, and in a short time, the men who had lately been enemies and borne arms against each other were again neighbors and friends, associating together, sending their children to the same school, becoming members of the same church. All experienced the difference between a civil war and peace and fraternity. Many of them expressed themselves that they had read of civil wars but never realized the effect of civil war until after they had passed through the present one. But they could not understand why they called it civil war, for if there was anything civil about the war, they never experienced that part of it. The author's family had been residing at Raleigh during most of the time of the war. He commenced making preparations to return to his home in Howell County in the fall of 1865. He began to organize an immigration party of men who wanted to locate in Howell County and a number of men who had left their homes in that county. Just a short time before the parties were ready to leave Rolla for Howell County, he was met by several men who asked 
Why, Monks, ain't you afraid to go back to Howe County? You have fought the rebels so bitterly and contested every inch of ground during the whole war, and some of them hate you so badly that I would be afraid that they would kill me. The author replied that he felt like General Putnam when the British attempted to bribe him and said that the colonies never could succeed in gaining their independence and that he had better return and renew his allegiance to the crown. The general's reply was, Damn a man that is not for his country. Now, what I reply to you is that I have forfeited almost all of my means and shattered the happiness of my family in contending and fighting for the preservation of the government. Besides, myself and family have been exiled and banished from our home, and if the rebels had succeeded, all would have been gone. But now, the government has been victorious in crushing the rebellion. Liberty and protection have been once more guaranteed to every citizen, high or low, rich or poor. And in the language of General Putnam, I say, I am a man that is afraid to go back and enjoy the fruits of his victory. Within a few days, about 25 families left Rolla for West Plains, and on arriving in West Plains, went into camp. There was not a single building left in West Plains, as the Confederates had burned the whole town in time of the war with the exception of one store building, which was burned by the Federal troops. The Confederates' object in burning the town was to prevent the Federals from establishing a post. The author procured some clapboards built in addition to an old stable about 200 yards south of where James Livery Stable is now located. Soon after we had reached West Plains and gone into camp, Captain Howard, Captain Nix and a number of other rebels who were residing in the county came in, met the author, and said to him, Captain, I am proud to meet you. The author replied, I am proud to meet you. What do you think now in regard to the two parties living together? He said that they were satisfied that both parties could live together, that all they wanted was protection. The author remarked that the rebels had been in control of the country for several years, but the loyal men were going to take charge of it and run it now, and as the loyal men had been contending for the enforcement of the law and claimed that every American citizen was entitled to the protection of the law, the author could promise them that, if they would fall into line and help enforce the law, they should receive equal protection with any other class of citizens to which they replied that they were willing to do so. But there were roving bands of rebels and guerrillas which had not been subject to the control of the Confederate authorities and still refused to lay down their arms and might yet cause some trouble. The author was appointed sheriff of Howe County, W.Z. Buck, circuit and county clerk, and Peter Lemons, Judge Alsop, and were appointed county judges. There had been an old schoolhouse about a quarter of a mile east of West Plains that was still standing. They met at that schoolhouse, organized and set the civil government of the county in working order. Soon after, Governor Fletcher ordered an election, and the author was elected to the state legislature, tendered his resignation as sheriff, which was accepted, and W.D. Mustian was appointed to the vacancy. In a few weeks, the author went to Jefferson City, tendered his credentials, and was sworn in and became a member of the legislature. Everything, so far as Howe County was concerned, appeared to move out quietly. While the counties of Oregon and Shannon, with a few of the border counties, were entirely controlled by irregular bands of late rebels, who openly declared that the Civil War should not be enforced in those counties, that the Confederacy was whipped, but they were not, and they intended to live off the government. They were armed to the teeth. During the winter of 1865 and the year 1866, Howe County settled up faster than ever it had at any period before the war. The men who had homes in it and had been forced away on account of the war mostly returned and commenced to improve their farms. Their houses, outhouses, and improvements generally haven't been destroyed. The soil was the only thing left. 
The town also built up rapidly, and in the year 1866, the inhabitants had increased to six or eight hundred. In the fall of 1866, at the general election, the author was re-elected to the legislature, and Captain Alley, who had been a Confederate all through the war, was elected to the legislature from Oregon County. The author again qualified and was present in the legislature during the whole time when the great question was brought up before the legislature as to what disposition the state would make of the first liens held by the state on the different railroads for aid that had been given to the railroad corporations in the way of state bonds in 1850. In 1855, the state issued their bonds, delivered them to the companies, and they went east and put them upon the market in New York and Boston to procure money to construct roads and the bonds with all the accruing interest were due to the state. Then, for the first time, they often learned that many of the men who had been selected to represent the people's interest in the state legislature failed to discharge the duties that their constituents had imposed upon them, betrayed their trust, and, through money, were entirely controlled in the interest of the railroad corporations. The author, believing that it was one among the greatest duties that were imposed upon men of a representative government to strictly contend and do all in his power to enact legislation in the interest of the people, therefore took a strong stand in favor of closing out all of the state liens against the different roads held by the state. During the session of the winter of 1866, what was then known as the South Missouri Pacific, which terminated at Rolla, Missouri, was ordered to be closed out and the road declared forfeited. A resolution passed through both houses of the legislature ordering the governor to seize it, and that said road be run by the state. In the meantime, the governor was to advertise and sell it. The governor, by authority of law, advertised it and sold it for $550,000. Sometime in April, the legislature adjourned, to meet in an adjourned session in December 1867. The author returned home. The immigration into the country rapidly increasing, prosperity appeared to be on every side. People had plenty of money, good crops, wheat was worth a dollar to a dollar fifty per bushel, stock of all kinds brought first-class prices, Peace so far as Howe County was concerned, prosperity, and the bettering of the condition of society were moving hand in hand, and the author felt thankful that the war was over.